In this video, we are going to talk about boundary layer in detail and its characteristics as well. Uh, in the previous video, I had given you some idea of what a boundary layer is and uh, how we basically uh, bring out this fictitious boundary surface as well and the figures that we looked at in the previous video. Uh, go and check that out if you haven't and uh, it's going to make things a little easier to understand for boundary layer now. And we need to talk about boundary layer because whenever we look at flow, external flow, uh, for example when we're talking about flow past an object, then it's a combination of like I said in the previous video, it's a combination of viscous flow within the boundary layer and inviscid flow everywhere else. And as we keep increasing the Reynolds number, and the Reynolds number is large enough, then viscous effects are important only in the boundary layer regions near the object or in the vague region that is behind the object. And this distinction is needed now, the boundary layer because boundary layer allows for no slip boundary condition to exist. And that requires that the fluid is going to stick to the surface, to any solid surface that it flows past. That means that the velocity is going to be zero on the surface. And then the velocity is going to keep on increasing. And some kind of velocity profile is going to exist until maximum velocity is going to reach. And the maximum velocity is going to be the same as the upstream velocity with this capital U. Okay. But what we need to discuss is that what is the size of this boundary layer? What defines the size of this boundary layer? And what is the structure of flow within this boundary layer as well? And to do that, we can consider the simplest case, which is that of a flat plate. Um, and this flat plate would be infinitely long and the flow is going to be a viscous incompressible fluid flow. Okay. So the thing is though that when we keep on increasing the Reynolds number and it's large enough, now when we're talking about a finite length plate then obviously it's clear that the length is going to be let's say L and then we can define Reynolds number easily in terms of uh, velocity into length divided by kinematic viscosity. Okay, but now when the flow becomes uh, something that we're looking at over an infinitely long plate, then that changes things now because when we're talking about an infinitely long plate, what we mean is that let's say this is x at zero, so x is zero over here. And then x is going to be infinite at this point, right? So now how do we evaluate what the Reynolds number is when the length is infinite, right? So to do that, what we say is that instead of looking at what the value of x is, we just input x as the length. So then Reynolds number is based on the coordinate x and we define it as velocity into length divided by kinematic viscosity. So for an infinitely, infinitely long plate we use x which is the coordinate distance along the plate from the leading edge, this is called the leading, the leading edge, and then this is the characteristic length now for Reynolds number here. Okay. Another thing is that um, the velocity beyond the boundary layer, so outside of the boundary layer, is going to be the same as that of the upstream velocity. So if you're looking at, let's say, velocity here, it's going to be capital U as well, the same as the upstream velocity. Okay. So that is something that you have to consider as well. And that's going to be the case except for when you come closer to uh, the plate inside the boundary layer. Then that changes because obviously uh, 
you've got fluid that is sticking to the surface because of no slip conditions, so velocity is zero. And then you've got some kind of velocity profile here until the velocity essentially starts becoming equal to the upstream velocity. And at that point, uh, the boundary layer ends. So now we can go ahead and look at the structure of the flow um, on this infinitely long flat plate. And what, what I mean by that is the structure of the flow within the boundary layer. right? So let's just look at this particle. We've got, we're assuming that we've got a rectangular, small rectangular particle. And now, obviously, it's going to retain its shape, its original shape, when it's moving outside of the boundary layer. Uh, because there's no rotational flow or anything like that. Um, but once it's going to enter into the boundary layer, this particle is going to start becoming distorted here. Okay. Because now, uh, the fluid is, uh, the fluid velocity is changing now, right? So because of that, um, because the velocity gradients that exist within the boundary layer the top of the particle is going to have a larger velocity. The lower part of the particle is going to have a smaller velocity. Right? This is uh, how it works. You've got zero velocity here, and then the velocity is going to keep on increasing until it reaches a maximum at the boundary layer, and outside of the boundary layer, it's going to be the same as the upstream velocity. So because of that, the top of the particle is going to have a larger velocity and larger speed as compared to the bottom of the particle. But the fluid particles are not going to rotate when they're flowing along outside of the boundary layer. Okay? But when once they're inside, once they're inside the boundary layer, inside this fictitious surface, this because this is this doesn't really exist, this surface, but uh, once they pass into this boundary layer surface, then they're entering into viscous flow. Or they're entering into flow that is dominated by viscous effects. That's more um, correct of a statement. So what we're essentially saying is that the flow is going to be irrotational outside of the boundary layer and because it's irrotational then that means it's going to have zero vorticity as well and the flow is going to have rotation within the boundary layer and when the flow has rotation then that means that it's going to have some kind of vorticity as well so once we start moving downstream from this leading edge uh, the boundary layer flow is going to start transitioning into turbulent flow. So you've got laminar boundary layer here, then obviously you've got, you've actually got a transitional region here. Okay, see there, you've got a transitional region here, and then it changes into turbulent uh, boundary layer. Okay, so when it becomes turbulent, then the fluid particles are going to become even more distorted now, because now you've got random irregular nature of turbulence as well here. Uh, when we had laminar flow, we only had mixing that was happening at a molecular scale. Okay, And now that it has transitioned into turbulent flow, then you're going to have eddies here and uh, you're going to have not only uh, molecular diffusion, but at the same time on a macroscopic scale as well you're going to have turbulent flow mixing that's going to be taking place. So then it's important for us to define the that what is the transition from the laminar boundary layer to a turbulent boundary layer. And that means we need to define a critical Reynolds number. Okay, So we need to define a critical Reynolds number and because we're talking about a, an infinitely long flat plate, so it's going to be REX. And usually this transition happens between somewhere around 2 and 2 to the power of 5 
to 3 into 10 to the power 6, but in our calculations, we are going to be defining, and, and usually as well, the critical Reynolds number for a flat plate for the transition from laminar boundary layer to turbulent boundary layer is defined as 5 into 10 to the power 5. So just make sure that uh, you remember, remember that you've obviously got different you've got a range but this is the value that is usually used another thing that we can physically imagine is that as we are going to be basically having a situation where the flow is becoming turbulent and as the velocity, the upstream velocity, the free stream velocity is going to be increasing. Uh, the critical length, which is XCR, so at which the flow is tra going to transition into turbulent flow, is going to start decreasing as well. It's going to start moving towards the leading edge, right? Because when the velocity is going to keep on increasing, that means that the Reynolds number is going to reach a point where it's more than 5 into 10 to the power of 5 earlier let's say some arbitrary point here instead of over here okay so that's one thing that you should uh, think about as well other than that um, we need to understand what the purpose of boundary layer is the, the purpose of the boundary layer is only for us to imagine or for us to allow the fluid to change its velocity from the upstream velocity of u to zero on the surface. Okay. That, that's what this boundary layer uh, typifies. And, uh, and in, in, in actuality, whether we're looking at it physically or mathematically, there is no sharp edge like you can see here at which we can say that okay this is the end of the boundary layer but obviously we need to uh, hypothesize or we need to imagine that some kind of boundary layer exists so uh, the velocity can keep on increasing and then it comes to a certain point where we're like okay this is where the boundary layer surface uh, exists and this delta over here defines the boundary layer thickness. It's the distance from the plate at which the fluid velocity uh, is within some arbitrary value of the upstream velocity. And usually what we say is that uh, it's the velocity that is going to be 0.99 or 99% of the upstream velocity. That's how we define this boundary layer thickness. This is called boundary layer thickness. And we can look at this boundary layer thickness as this, that you've got boundary layer thickness to a point where it's 99% off the upstream velocity or the free stream velocity. And uh, there's one thing to point out here that the thickness of the boundary layer we define it in different ways so this is the boundary layer thickness and then you've got something called a boundary layer displacement thickness let me just show you that as well this is the boundary layer thickness this is the standard boundary layer thickness and then uh, you've got situation where you can think of it in terms of boundary layer displacement thickness and what that means is that if you've got let's say obviously you've got a velocity deficit which is capital U minus U that exists within the boundary layer so that means that the flow rate across this section is going to be less than if you were looking at the inviscid flow across section AA here Okay, so what that means is that we can displace this plate at section A uh, 
by some amount, which would be delta star, and that would be the boundary layer displacement thickness, and then the flow rates would be identical. Uh, so what the displacement thickness represents is the amount that the thickness of the body has to be increased so that this fictitious uniform inverse flow has the same mass flow rate properties as the actual viscous flow. Okay. Uh, in a way, let me just give you an example. So maybe it's going to make things a bit clearer. Let's say you've got a duct, a square duct, and you've got a uniform flow that is entering into this duct. So you've got some fluid and you've got uniform uh, flow that is entering into this duct. Okay. So it has some kind of velocity, let's say, let's call this velocity u. And now these are walls of the duct. So that means that you can treat this as a flat plate and then you can treat this as a flat plate as well, right? Uh, that has uh, no thickness. Now what's going to happen? Because of the surface, you're going to have um, zero velocity that is going to be at the, th uh, at the surface and then velocity is going to keep on increasing as you move away from the wall. So obviously there's going to be some kind of boundary layer here in which the viscous effects are going to be important. Okay. So let me just make that for both these. So viscous effects are important within this boundary layer and within this boundary layer here. And then when you look at the velocity profile, the velocity is let's say zero on both these points and then the velocity is going to increase, increase until it becomes equal to the upstream velocity here, right? So that's the upstream velocity here, and it's going to keep on increasing until it reaches this point. Just like that over here as well, you're going to have the same impact because of the boundary layer. So essentially, you've got uniform velocity over here, right? You've got uniform velocity from here until here. And then the velocity is obviously... Uh, different over there. So what the displacement thickness delta star says is that the flow rate across this, so if I'm calling this section 2 let's say, so the flow rate across this section 2 is the same as that for a uniform flow with velocity u through a duct whose walls have been moved inward by delta star. Let me just repeat that. The definition of the displacement thickness delta star says that the flow rate across this section is going to be the same as that for a uniform flow with velocity u through a duct whose walls have been moved inward by delta star. So if I was to, uh, let's, let's just look at it like this. Let me take this to a point where, let's say, I've got actually the flow entering, imaginary flow that is entering into this duct, is entering so that it's entering from, let me, let me change the color. So what we're saying is that the duct its walls have been moved inwards up until this point, okay? And then delta star is the amount by which you have moved this duct inwards for the uniform flow, okay? That is what boundary layer displacement thickness is. And mathematically, it's represented by this expression I'm not going to go into the details of it and just like that you also have another boundary layer thickness definition which is called the boundary layer momentum thickness represented by theta and that is 
usually used when you're trying to determine drag on an object. And again, boundary layer momentum thickness, it's something that is being defined in terms of momentum flux. Okay, when we talk about momentum flux, it's basically density into velocity. So in terms of momentum flux, you can also define the concept of boundary layer. So there's different ways and definitions on the basis of which you can define the boundary layer concept. Uh, and all of it is based on the fact that the boundary layer is very, very thin. Okay. What that means is that um, whether you're looking at delta, which is the standard boundary layer thickness, that is going to be a lot, lot smaller than x, okay, which is any location on the plate. Just like that, when you're looking at delta star, which is the boundary layer displacement thickness, it's going to be a lot, lot smaller than x as well. And then if you're looking at theta, which is the boundary layer momentum thickness, again, that is a lot, lot smaller than the length, the flat plate. So the structure and the properties of the boundary layer flow obviously depend on whether the flow is laminar or whether it's turbulent and uh, the boundary layer thickness and then obviously the wall shear stress as well are going to be different in both these regimes as well. We've talked about the wall shear stress for pipe flow uh, and essentially we can apply the same concept uh, albeit with some other distinctions uh, for the wall shear stress when we talk about a flat plate flow. We're going to look at that as well in the next video, which is a continuation of this video.